Z Brook family. We sure miss you guys. Can't wait to be back in the house of the Lord worshiping with you. See you soon. Hi, Ruth and Morris. We miss you at Lazy Brook. Can't wait to be back together. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Hello, Lazy Brook family. This is Tony and Debbie Garza. <laughs> oh, and let's not forget Coda. Um, we miss you guys. We look forward to seeing y'all soon. And just uh, hang in there. And Coda, stop Ouch. biting. <laughs> Love you guys. We'll see y'all soon. Bye. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. If this is your first time joining us at Lazy Brook Baptist Church, we'd love to give you a virtual fist bump. And the way that we do that is you can text the word fist bump to 97000. That's fist bump, one word, to 97000. And then we'll get back in touch with you and let you know a little bit of information about our church. Um, something else we'd like for you to do, and you can do this whether it is uh, your first time joining us or whether you've been joining us online every Sunday, um, is we'd love for you to get involved in the comment section on Facebook and YouTube. Um, if Zach makes a really good point in a sermon, jump in there and say, amen. Or if Zach tells a really bad, cheesy joke, jump in there and say, boo. Just kidding. Um, no, but seriously, we want to hear from you. We want to hear where you're joining us from. So don't be afraid to jump in on that comment section. Another thing that you can do is if these worship services have been meaningful to you, go ahead and press that share button. Um, because the chances are, if they've been meaningful to you, uh, they'll be meaningful to someone else as well. Uh, this morning, our worship service is about the idea that God is greater than our distress. Um, and these days, people are feeling distress for a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of people feeling economic distress um, because we are in the middle of a big time economic disruption. There's a lot of people feeling distress because of isolation. Maybe it's been a while since they've seen friends uh, or family members. And other people are feeling distress because um, of their health. Um, but regardless of why you may be feeling distress, we, we want to encourage you to, to bring that and lay it at the altar today. Um, confess that to God um, and let him um, uh, come back to you with faith and encouragement. Turn that over to him. Join us as we worship. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you Cause you called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day mercy has saved my soul and now your freedom is all that I know the old made new Jesus when I met you cause you called my name and I Glorious 
My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you called my name, This morning, as we think about what it means that God is greater than our distress, um, as we enter into our time of prayer this morning, um, I've got three different groups of people that I'd like for us to pray for. Um, there's three different groups of people that I'm thinking of today who, who are um, uh, feeling a lot of distress right now. And so I'd like for us to pray for people who are feeling economic distress. I'd like for us to pray for our senior adults, and I'd like for us to pray for our children. And this is how I'd like for us to do it. Um, I, we'll begin by, um, I'll, I'll voice um, a, a short prayer for each of those groups. And then I'll leave a, a brief time of silence where you can either um, pray with the other people who are in your household or even just pray silently to yourself, however you wanna do that. But for example, if um, if I'm praying for people who are in economic distress, maybe you've got someone specific on your mind, or maybe you are that person. Don't worry about it. Say a prayer for yourself if that's what you feel like you need to do, or, or say a prayer for that specific person that you're thinking of. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pray in that way, and at the end, uh, we'll close out with something we've been, been doing for the last couple of weeks, and we will pray through a psalm together. And so join us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we are so glad that we are always uh, in your presence and that you are always with us. Heavenly Father, Lord, distress is one of those things that can uh, sometimes cause us to feel outside of your presence. Lord, today people are feeling distressed for a number of reasons. And we pray first today for those who are feeling economic distress, maybe because they have lost a job, um, maybe because they've had to take a pay cut, maybe they've been furloughed, or, or even just the uh, uncertainty of these times is causing them distress. Heavenly Father, we pray for them right now. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, today there are a number of children um, who are feeling distressed. 
Uh, some of them because it's coming to the end of the school year and they haven't seen their friends in a while and they know it's going to be a while before they can see their friends again. Um, some children, uh, when without schools being open this summer, will have um, a hard time finding a place to eat lunch. And children who live um, in abusive homes are feeling especially distressed right now, Heavenly Father, because there is nowhere for them to escape to. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would release them from those terrible situations. We pray that your spirit would be with these children today. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we also want to lift up our senior adults, both in our church and in the broader community. Um, Lord, these folks may be feeling distress um, because they are in an age range uh, where they are more at risk um, for the coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, or perhaps they are feeling lonely from not having been able to go to church or to see family and loved ones, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that right now in their distress, you would bless them with your presence. We would pray that you would bless them with an extra measure of faith, encouragement, and hope. Lord, hear our prayers. Pray with me now, Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This is the word of the Lord for God's people. Amen. How many of you have ever played paintball? If you have, I want you to go ahead and let, let me know in the comments, because honestly, paintball growing up was one of my favorite sports. As a, as a matter of fact, it was uh, my dad and I, it was sort of our, our father-son bonding time, which, I mean, what says father-son bonding like going and shooting each other with paint pellets in the woods. I mean, it's great father-son bonding time. Uh, we even had a sort of a, an, not an operation going, but we, we would typically have 10 or 15 guys that would come with us and we would buy the paint for everybody and the CO2 for everybody. And then they would just pay us and we earned just enough money so that it was pretty affordable for us to play, which was awesome because we played, <laughs> my dad and I growing up, pretty much every other weekend. But I remember one specific week, we, we were playing paintball, and we decided to try a new game. It's called President's Men. And in this game, there, you choose one person to be the president, and it's his team's job to protect him and get him from point A to point B. So me, being the youngest one out there, of course I get selected, Zach, you're going to be the president. You're the smallest target which I guess makes logical sense. Um, so we get ready, and it's my team's job to get me from point A to point B without the other team shooting me or getting me out. So we, we start and, and we're playing, but the only thing is, if you're the president, you don't get a gun. Like, you have no paintball gun. You just have this team that's protecting you, um, but you don't have a gun. So it, it was interesting. I remember, you know, we started, and the, these guys are protecting me and, and trying to keep me from getting out, and all of a sudden this firefight starts and I don't have a gun. So I'm like, uh, I'm just going to hunker down right here. I guess I'll just chill behind this tree. So I, I'm chilling behind that tree. And one by one, the guys on my team, I hear out, out, out. And I'm doing the math in my head. I'm like, all right, we got five guys left, four guys, three, two. Oh, good. It's just me. And so I remember in this moment, there was this uh, sort of sense of, of distress that came over me. I was like, I'm the only one left, and I don't even have a gun. Like, what is going on? I remember for those that you say, okay, what do you mean, the, the sense of distress? Dictionary.com 
uh, defines distress this way. It says, great pain, anxiety, or sorrow, acute physical or mental suffering, affliction, or trouble. Uh, Oxford University Press uh, says that distress is extreme anxiety, sorrow, or pain. So when I say I felt distressed, that's, uh, that's what that means. Anyway, so um, I decided, I, I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, really my only option is to just run as fast as I can. Uh, in, in hope that I can outrun the other team and that they're, they're not going to get me out. So that's what I do. I run to my destination as fast as I can. And I'm happy to say uh, that I was a- able to outrun the other team. And we ended up winning even though I was the only guy on my team left. So it was a fun game. But I, I tell you that story. I know it's a, a funny story about being distressed and, and worried. But I tell you that story because today we're going to talk about how God is greater than distress. And we've talked through God is greater than loneliness, unrest, fear, and worry. And so today we're going to focus on distress. And I know, you know, that's a, a funny story of being distressed in, in the midst of a game of paintball um, when you don't have a, a gun and people are shooting at you. But I remember some other times in my life that were, um, there, there was a lot of anxiety or, or distress as well. I remember when I was 18 months old, uh, I don't remember this very well, I was 18 months old, but I, I had spinal meningitis and, and went into a coma for, for three days. And the, the doctors honestly told my parents that he, he's, he's not likely going to make it. Uh, and I, I remember just the, the distress and anxiety from hearing from my family that they felt during that time. I also remember fast forward to, to college and high school, or high school, college, and, and then seminary, but mainly college and seminary. I had a number of mentors of mine within the course of a few years who had uh, moral failures in their life that uh, a number of them had to to leave ministry uh, because of that. I remember right after I got married and Melody and I started seminary, the job that I had, the they lost the funding for my position. So I lost my job. And here I am, uh, a new seminary student, a, a new husband. I'm like, how, how am I going to provide uh, for my wife? I also remember just a few years ago, God called Melody and I to move to Texas from North Carolina. We were at a church that we loved. We loved our house, and you know, we had two amazing kids. And God said, hey, pack up and move. And we're like, why? Um, what, what are you calling us to, God? We, we, we love you. We trust you. But what What are you calling us to do? And um, so I remember these t- these instances of just feeling anxiety and distress in each and every one of these instances. I know each and every one of you could give examples of times in your life where you've felt distress. And the question I want to ask is, who do you rely upon in moments of affliction or distress? When distressed in life, whether it's a lost job, uh, let down by a friend or a family member, a loss of a loved one, or difficulty um, with your children, or, or feeling alone or isolated or whatever, who do you rely upon most? Because today we're going to look at Romans 5, verses 1 through 5, and and see that the gospel gives hope that dissipates distress. The gospel gives hope that dissipates distress. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And I want to give you a little bit of background while you're turning there in your Bible. You see, what, what's going on here in Romans is Paul, in, ver, in chapters 1 through 3, he's talked about our need for salvation. That there's no one righteous, not even one. We desperately need salvation. And then in chapters 3 and 4, Paul has talked about the way of salvation, that it's through Christ alone. There's no other way to be saved but through faith in Christ. And so Paul has taught through that, and we come to chapter 5, and now Paul begins to talk about the fruit of salvation. And what we see in this passage, is that salvation equals peace with God. Peace with God equals hope. And gospel-centered hope dissipates distress. So read with me, uh, if you will, Romans 5, uh, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proving character. And proving character produces hope. 
This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So I want us to look at, and we're going to see a few things in this passage. The first thing that we're going to see is that we have peace with God. We see this in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous, or some translations use the word justified, since we've been declared righteous, since we've been justified, how? By faith in what Jesus did on the cross. The result is we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, we, we need to address, okay, what does justified mean? Sometimes that's a, a churchy word. What in the world does justified mean? I remember when I was young, I, I learned it this way, and hopefully it'll help you remember it as well. Justified means that it's made just as if I'd never sinned. So it, it has to do with our legal standing before God, that it's made just as if we had never sinned. We're made right before God. Let, let me give you a visual illustration that I, that I hope will help you understand justification. It would be like if I went to court and the judge said, Zachary, you're clearly guilty. Here's your fine. That would be just because I'm guilty. But what if the judge were to walk off that stand and pay the fine on my behalf? That's what Jesus did for us. See, God looks at us, and just as Paul has said in the beginning of Romans, all of us have sinned. We're guilty. But God sends Jesus to walk down and pay the penalty on our behalf so that we could be made right with God. So when we hear the word justified, it means made right. It has to do with a legal standing before God that we're made right with him. So we see that we have peace with God, but in verse 2, we see that we have access to God. Verse 2, it says it this way. We have also obtained access through him by what? By faith into this grace in which we stand. And so what we see here is that salvation is through faith alone. It is through faith in what Jesus did on the cross. And because of our faith in that, we now have access to God where we didn't before because our sin separated us. We now have access to God. John Stott says it this way. He says, we do not fall in and out of grace like courtiers who may find themselves in and out of favor with their sovereign or politicians with the public. No, we stand in it. For that is the nature of grace. Nothing can separate us from God's love. So if the gospel provides peace with God and access to him, who would it make sense that we turn to in times of distress? It would make sense that, that we as believers, we turn to God because he's the one who gives peace. He's the one that we have access to. And the third thing that we see in this passage is that God gives hope even amidst distress. Verse 2 says it this way. It says, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We see here that the gospel brings hope and that the object of that hope is the glory of God. But what is meant when the passage refers to the glory of God? What's it saying? Well, I think it has a number of things in mind when it says the glory of God. We see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. We see um, in John 1 verse 14 that God, Jesus is God's word made flesh. We see the glory of God in the gospel that, that comes alive in us. We see in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen 17, we were created to bear the image and glory of God. But Romans 3, 23, we fell short, we sinned, we rebelled. But because of Christ's sacrifice, those who, who believe in what Jesus did on the cross, as Romans 8, 17 says, that we will share in his glory again one day. You see, Jesus died on the cross to make us right. And so we see God's glory in Jesus' death and resurrection and in the transformation of our lives. We also see the glory of God in creation, that creation was made to declare God's glory. We see that in Psalm 19, 1. But sin also affected creation. But we see in Romans 8, 21, creation one day will also be set free. So all of this in, is in mind 
is the object and reason for our hope as we speak of the glory of God. This, this is what's in mind when we speak of the glory of God. It makes me think of, of Romans or Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. It says this, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making all things new. This is the glory of God that we hope in. And we read this passage and we see that that God is going to make all things new. And it reminds us as believers that we need to keep a heavenly mindset. We need to realize that our distress is temporary and small compared to the glory of eternity. You see, the glory of God is is manifested in the fact that in in what Jesus did on the cross, that he paid the penalty for our sins, the glory of God is manifested in the, the way that our lives are transformed when we come to know him. The glory of God is manifested in that one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth with no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying. And that's what this passage is referring to when it says the glory of God. But we've got to keep in mind Revelation 21. One day is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But we've got to live with a heavenly mindset. I I think that sometimes we as believers, we concern ourselves too much with things of the world. Not realizing that we were created for eternity. And so we need to keep a heavenly mindset. Realizing that our distress is temporary and small compared to the glory of God of eternity with God. John Stott, he says it this way. He says, Christian hope is not uncertain. Like our ordinary everyday hopes about the weather or our health, it is a joyful and confident expectation which rests on the promises of God. The promise is that one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where we will spend eternity with God. And that's where our hope is, not in the things of this world. And this, this is what is meant when Paul says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But the passage, it, it doesn't stop here. It goes on in verses 3 through 4. It says this, and not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions. <laughs> Hold on, Paul. Okay, we, we get that we rejoice in the, in the glory of God, that that's where our hope is, but We rejoice in our afflictions? What are you saying in the midst of our suffering, our anxiety, our distress? We're to rejoice? That's what Paul says. Why? Because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. You see, what Paul is saying here is he's saying that as believers, we have a Christ-centered hope, even amidst affliction. So in the, in the midst of affliction, that Christ-centered hope, it gives us the endurance to continue trusting and obeying. And as we continue to trust and obey, our character is proven and we're drawn closer to God. And as a result, the hope that we have is actually strengthened. There's a commentator by the name of Douglas Moo, and he says it this way. He says, suffering or distress rather than threatening or weakening our hope, as we might expect to be the case, will instead increase our certainty in that hope. Hope, like a muscle, will not be strong if it goes unused. It is in suffering or distress that we must exercise with deliberation and fortitude our hope. And the constant reaffirmation of hope in the midst of apparently hopeless circumstances, will bring ever deeper conviction of the reality and certainty of that for which we hope. What Douglas Moo is saying is that as as anxiety and distress come our way, the hope that we have in Christ 
will be strengthened by the adversity that we face. There's um, a missionary by the name of Amy Carmichael, uh, and I think she she's a great illustration of what it means to walk through adversity, yet have that adversity strengthen the hope that we have in Christ. I want to tell you her story. Um, Amy Carmichael was a, a missionary to India for over 50 years. At the age of 15 years old, she accepted Christ. At the age of 16, her, her father lost his job and moved the whole family to Ireland uh, so he could find work. When Amy was 18, her father died and left the fa- family in a very, very tough financial place. When Amy was 21 years old, because of the tough financial place that the family was in, they were forced to move to England to avoid bankruptcy. While in England, Amy heard Hudson Taylor, who who was another missionary that I quoted last week, she heard him speak and felt called to missions. But also at the age of 21, Amy was diagnosed with neurology, a disease that attacked her nerves and made her whole body weak and achy, often keeping her in bed for weeks at a time. But she still felt this call to missions, and she still felt God calling her to go. And at the age of 26, with that desire to go, she was rejected by the mission agency due to her health. So finally, after talking to other agencies, she found an agency that would send her and went on her first missionary journey to Japan. A little bit later, when she was 27, her her neuralgia became so bad that the doctors told her that she must leave Japan for a more suitable climate. So after recovering a little bit, at the age of 28, Amy moved to India for a long-term missions work, despite her medical issues. And at the age of 34, she founded the Donover Fellowship, which the Donover Fellowship was a safe refuge for children who had been subjected to temple prostitution in the Hindu temples. And through the Donover Fellowship, She provided safe refuge for over a thousand children in her lifetime. What Amy saw when when she went to India is that these children were being sold to the temples and and being forced to be essentially temple prostitutes. And she said, that's not okay. And and so she put her own health, her own safety on the line and said, no, I'm going to rescue these children because that's what God's called me to do. He's called me to rescue them. And so she rescued in her lifetime over a thousand children. And uh, the, the government and the priests were not happy about this. Uh, she, she had, uh, they, they fought against her, but she, she was willing to put her safety on the line and say, no, this is not right. I'm, I'm, go- I'm going to take care of these children. And, and a number of the children were asked what drew them to come to Amy. And they often said this, they said, it was love. Ama, as they called her. She loved us. And so for 30 years, this is, this is what Amy did. Until the age of 64, she broke her leg and ankle and badly damaged her hip and her back. And along with her neuralgia, this left her unable to, to fully walk again, that she was kept in bed for the remainder of her life. But did that stop her? No. Amy continued to, to run the Donover Fellowship until she passed away at the age of 83. So for over 50 years, Amy was faithful amidst all the suffering that that was in her life. You see, we we hear the story in Amy Carmichael. She knew suffering. She knew hardship. She knew distress. But she also knew hope, which led her to say this. She said, let us not be surprised when we have to face difficulties. When the wind blows hard on a tree, the roots stretch and grow the stronger. Let it be so with us. And my prayer is that it, it, we have, it, we as believers, we have hope in Christ and that when we encounter distress, that it would stretch us and grow us and renew the hope that we have in Christ and renew the hope that this, this world is not our home, that we were created to spend eternity with God. And that this hope is what leads Paul in verse 5 to say this. He says, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. See, what we've seen in this passage is is we've seen clearly that salvation, it means peace with God. Our peace with God gives us hope. And the gospel gives hope that dissipates distress. 
And so for those of you as you're, you're listening, we, we hear that story of Amy Carmichael and her, her hope and Christ did not disappoint even in the midst of incredible difficulty. And so I want to ask you, how's your hope in Christ? Are you putting your hope in Him in the midst of distress and uncertainty and in the midst of anxiety? Are you putting your hope in Him and are you allowing your hope in Him to be renewed and strengthened? Or are you focused on the troubles and the hardship of this world? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that in the midst of distress, we would allow it to renew our strength in you. And that the the trials that we face in this world would draw us closer to you and reaffirm the hope that we have. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Yeah Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are and Upon your love It is I
thank you once again for joining us. Um, throughout this week, we've got a number of other opportunities for you to join us. We've got some Facebook Lives, we've got some Zoom meetings, and of course, all of our small groups are continuing to meet some in person and some online. There's been a little bit of a change in the schedule, but we've got that schedule up on the screen for you, and you can also check it out on our church website. I also want to remind you that we are still able to accept our tithes and offerings. Um, you can mail those in. You can actually text in your tithe and offering, or you can give online. The different ways to do that are up on your screen, and you can also find them on the church website. Uh, finally, as we as we close here this morning, I want to leave you from uh, with these words from Paul, um, who, who wrote them in a time of great distress for him when he was in prison. And he said this, he said, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May the peace of Christ be with you as you go.